Hi, welcome. I am Nanette Carter and you're in my studio and I'm going to give you a tour of my work in just a moment. I first wanna to talk to you about a show that's coming up at the Art Students League. It's called Creating Community Cinque Gallery Artists. Uh, this is a show that's going to be celebrating Cinque Gallery that was in existence for 35 years, showing close to 500 African-American artists. The exhibit will have 45 of those 500 and uh, there will be a catalog. The show is up from May 3rd to July 4th. I hope you can come. Cinque Gallery started in 1969. It was started by three artists, Ernie Critchlow, Norman Lewis, and Romare Bearden. They noticed that there was a cultural extinction of sorts of African-American people, creative people. And at the time, in other words, African-Americans were not being seen in galleries or museums, even here in New York City, which in the 60s was becoming the mecca of the art world on the globe. And so these three artists, these three formidable men, started this gallery to exhibit other African-American artists, some of their fellow compatriots in the movement. And again, I say in the movement because the civil rights movement had started certainly by the late 50s, mid to late 50s and on into the 60s. The space was quite special for artists not only to exhibit, but also to come together. Hence this title for the show, Creating Community Cinque Gallery Artists. I first heard about Cinque probably around 1982. The first exhibition I went to was Tyrone Mitchell, wonderful sculptor. And this was in their space when they were in the 60s, West 60s. Cinque Gallery moved around a bit. It actually started in Joseph Papp's building uh, back in, again, 1969. But I went to see this show and it was incredible. There were no track lights on, but the gallery space was high up in the building and there were apparently uh, well, very large windows. And um, I just remember this natural light flowing through the windows and probably a skylight also. And to see his sculptures that were basically made of, of wood and possibly gourds, these natural, this natural phenomena with this natural light hitting it, there was a spiritual quality. I, I was the only one in the space. There was something very meditative about it. And that's what really stuck in my head. It was also, I think, a sense of African sculptural works, kind of iconic uh, shapes that we would see in African sculpture, but brought into a 20th century kind of realm. You know, he had put his own tip to it. Tyrone had put his own tip to it. Really very mm -hmm. stunning. Uh, and clearly something that, that stayed with me. And, and I thought, wow, okay, we've got a space. We've got a space where folks can show. And it wasn't until I think after going to many openings there and then the gallery moved to 72nd Street, uh, just diagonally across from the Dakota, ground level windows, I think it probably had been a, a medical office, a dental office or something, and uh, small space. But I started to go to the openings there and I met Ruth Jett and began to meet the other people, Ernie Critchlow and Norman. I met only once. I think I only saw him once. And then, of course, Bearden, Romare Bearden. In 1984, Ruth Jett asked me to be an artist in residence. This was going to be their first artist in residence. And I recall the money, I believe, came from the New York State Council on the Arts. I had been teaching over in New Jersey at the time. I was teaching printmaking and drawing at the Dwight Englewood School. And uh, 
I decided, you know, let's take a half a year off and see what it's like to be a full-time artist. You know, why not? So they gave me the residency, which was great. It was the first residency for Cinque Gallery. And of course, it just changed my mind totally about the whole aspect of being a full-time artist and what that meant. I was also going on Saturdays to Abyssinian Baptist Church to conduct two classes. One was for young people. Uh, we were drawing and painting and what have you. And then the other class was for adults who were interested in creating uh, cottage industries, whether that be quilts or aprons, uh, things that they could make and then sell in the community. And I do recall Ruth Jett was able to get a show at Medgar Evers uh, College in Brooklyn. And we took the art, the, the art of the adults and the young people over to Medgar Evers and hung a show. Uh, that next year, 1985, I had my solo show. And that was an exhibit of my works titled Illumination. I had just come back from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and uh, was just amazed at the African retention. There are 48 works in the series Illumination. 10 of these works were in the exhibition at the St. K Gallery in 1985. With Illumination number 21, you see these shapes that seem to be jutting out from the bottom. I was really trying to capture Sugarloaf Mountain, which is an amazing mountain that just juts out of the sea there on Ipanema Beach. The texture is really relating to the granite stone that you see, uh, along with there were, there were certainly some trees that were growing, but it's an amazing structure, just the shape of it. And so not only am I trying to capture that shape, but I'm also trying to give you the sense of motion as we see in illumination number 29. This was the image that was on the invitation for the show. So this sense of a metronome rocking back and forth uh, in combination with these incredible mountains, including Cocovado Mountain, was what I was after. And in this particular one, you get a sense of clouds floating by and uh, this kind of celebratory feeling uh, and staccato-like quality of the mark making. In fact, when I was making this piece, I can tell you the sound of the mark, sound of making the marks was very rhythmical also. In the streets of Brazil, of, of Rio de Janeiro, music is everywhere. It's very uh, festive. There's quite a bit of verve and energy in the city streets. So illumination number 30 is really trying to capture, again, that celebratory feeling. And so I am going to take you around my studio and uh, walk you through some of the things that are happening today and what I'm thinking about today. I'm working on three series at once. I kind of jump around between the series. And uh, one is cantilevered. And you're actually looking at one of the installation cantilevered pieces behind me. Um, and then we'll walk around and, and see also some of the Afro Sentinels. And the Afro Sentinels are to protect all black and brown peoples across the globe from any injustices. Then we also have the series, The Weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, talking about the weight of history, the weight of this particular time period, all of that being felt on our shoulders. I'm sure that we all have felt a great weight around this COVID period. I'm calling it the age of COVID. Um, so I'm using basically shape, line, and color to tell my stories. I have no figures in these pieces, but I think just the same, uh, these are universal properties. These are universal themes in more way than one. Uh, universal in terms of using shapes and showing with those shapes different dynamics 
uh, universal also in the fact that uh, black and brown people all over the globe, not just this country, uh, are being mistreated as we speak. Uh, universal in that we're all dealing with COVID and the weight of this pandemic. I'm hoping that these works in some ways are also hopeful. I hope that, uh, did you see the beauty in these works? And, and I'd like to say that uh, I feel that all work, all works of art, no matter who's creating it or how they're creating it, it all has content. It can't help but have content. If it's coming from a human person who's experienced and, and has recognized and analyzed uh, their environment, uh, their social existence, then it's going to have content. Uh, and the content could be color, color in itself. And the reaction of one color to another, you know, the push and pull, the idea of spatial play, kind of that Hans Hoffman uh, theory of spatial play in abstract art. It could be about line, but that's content. Line is content. Line has content. Uh, a doodle has content. When you look at, you've done, when you were listening to a professor speak or someone lecturing and you look at it, I'm sure that there's expression of that moment. That's content. Man can't create anything without content. I think it's absolutely impossible. Uh, my father did get his doctorate in divinity and he was very much uh, an influence in my life in terms of my art because he did get involved in politics and he was a part of the NAACP. My mother was a part of the National Council of Negro Women. Uh, I heard talk around the table all the time about the civil rights movement. I have a great picture of my dad with Martin Luther King who came to our town of Montclair, New Jersey to Union Baptist Church, our church to speak. Um, I can tell you that around our dinner table, uh, especially on Sundays, cause um, folks would come by after to have dinner. There was always conversation about the movement. Black folks were always talking about what was going on and how one could better yourself as we also paid taxes, went to school, made love, tried to have joy and happiness and a sense of future. So my father actually became mayor of Montclair uh, and he was very active there in the town uh, even prior to becoming mayor. But he understood what needed to happen there. And again, the conversation around the dinner table as a child and my, my parents never said, leave the table, the adults are talking. None of that ever happened. So sometimes I got tired, you know, and I left, of course, you know. But uh, as I got older, I would remain my sister and I would stick around. And of course, as we became more enmeshed and reading about what was going on, we took part in the discussion. And my parents really allowed for that. Uh, and I know that made a big difference in our lives, uh, being considered a part of this discussion with these adults and having our own points of view as the next generation. And then my mother who taught dance, as a child of six, seven years old, I would attend her classes. And mom taught ballet, tap, and modern dance. And there were recitals. So I saw her creating these moves for her students to make across the stage. This is moving sculpture. Um, and I, I think I was truly fascinated with watching mom create these moves and, and then seeing everyone mimicking her, you know. Uh, but then also mom would sew the costumes. So this is back in the day when I think everyone was sewing. You know, you had McCall's patterns, 
bow patterns. Everyone had a sewing machine, but my mom was creating tutus. So there was tulle and there was sequins and, and taffeta and just different materials, different textures, different colors. And she's sewing and piecing these uh, wonderful fabrics together to make this whole, to make this tutu, to make this outfit. And my mother would sew our clothes also. I recall her sewing clothes for my sister and me. Um, and so I think this idea of collaging and bringing different forces together in some kind of harmony or discord, uh, but to tell a story in that way, I think started with me looking at my mom and what she was doing. So they were definitely a force in my creative life. This is one of the installations that comes under the series Cantilevered. Cantilevered is a structure that I thought was such a great metaphor for living in the 21st century. The area here to the right is what's really hitting the ground. This bottom area is what's touching the ground and it's what's holding everything else up. But I want you to see some of the textures that I work with. I've come up with these textures and even in that black shape, again, this is mylar. This is all oils on mylar. Uh, even with that black shape, you can see a bit of the yellow coming through. Mylar is transparent. And so I love using the mylar and really employing that transparency as a factor in the work. And this area all the way to the right, you'll see there's a lot of collaging going on. This is a painterly area. It is collaged. And this is the area that is, again, sort of the plinth that's holding up the rest of this structure that you see. And so all of these facets, all of these shapes are shapes that I have come up with. This is, none of this is appropriate. I'm really dealing with many different types of surfaces. I love to, uh, actually create these different surfaces. I'm coming up with different ways of getting them to be very tactile um, and very painterly in some areas, but really trying to make the surfaces really quite rich and enliven this piece. I think there's a sense of sound in this one. I think it's that shape there with the black in the center. There's something that seems to be moving across. It's very uh, rhythmical uh, also. And uh, coming across, we have some of my Afro Sentinels. These are Sentinels that are guarding and taking care of all people of color around the world from discrimination, from injustices, and again, it doesn't matter what size the uh, sentinel is, uh, it still has the power and the ability to protect all people of color. You'll notice these works are really straight on the wall. I love to have them uh, right on the wall. There's no uh, framing or anything kind of in the way. Um, just sort of this directness. Here's one which is actually kind of unique. I, I love the fact that this is bowing due to the weight that it's carrying here. This sort of table is where everything is being held up. Uh, that's what is actually sitting then on the ground, okay? And holding up the rest of this structure. But just coming in closer to take a look at some of the brushwork that's happening 
different types of brushwork, amounts of paint on the brush. This is one of my surfaces that I've actually come up with. I have a recipe uh, that I use to have this wonderful surface. It's really a bit of a relief. It, there is a uh, relief aspect to it. Um, and then these other surfaces. The one all the way to the right is actually a, a yellow sitting on top of an oil blue that I've painted on. This green surface, the darker area is a black that's on the back side of the mylar. Again, the mylar is transparent and the green that you see is on the front side. So I also like to employ this idea that uh, you know, I'm painting on both sides of the surface. If you've never seen mylar, um, here's just a, a piece of mylar so you can see the transparency factor. I'm working on the frosted side. That's what's holding the pigment. I only work with oils. Uh, I do use oil stick also, and I will use color pencil here and there. Here's another one. Again, that lower area is the stand or plinth that everything else is standing up on. This one has two feet. I like to call them feet um, that are holding this up because again, I'm thinking of this in terms of all of the different uh, elements that we're dealing with here living in the 21st century. Social media, technology, some people have two and three jobs. Right now, I have three jobs. Um, just trying to balance one's life. And in some instances, you'll see some parts of it are actually teetering. Some parts are sort of slightly falling off. That also kind of gives it a rhythmical quality, which I would love to uh, also employ in my work. And let's just come in a little close so that you can see some of the different mark making that's going on. That's oil stick that you see there in terms of the linear work. This uh, stratification here that's going on, um, which I love to do, uh, is a print. And what you're seeing here is a slight rubbing along with um, just going back with a brush and breaking up that surface, very tactile using this idea of cantilevered as a metaphor for living in this time. And sometimes things need to fall off just so that you can maintain your balance. Um, again, this is where the use of shapes can really help to tell a story. This piece I just finished I work on the floor. I work on my table. And I work on the wall. Depending on what I need, the kind of space I need or whatever. And sometimes as I get older, it's actually easier for me to paint on the floor, especially with the large shapes. This piece is over six feet in height. Normally, I start at the bottom and work my way up. Even with the smaller pieces, there's something about that bottom, uh, again, the stand where everything is, is going to be piled up on, the area that's holding all of this cantilevered structure. Um, but in this one, I started with the blue. The blue kind of got me going. And uh, I have not glued this all together. So you see some of the edges sticking up a bit. This is all taped up on the wall. I will eventually come back and cut a huge piece of mylar that will then go on top of this. I'll make an outline of it. I'll cut the shape out. And then I glue all of this mylar onto mylar. And in fact, here is my trusty 52 inches high mylar. 
and I normally get about um, 90 yards or so. I have a place down south that actually makes just reams and reams of the stuff. Um, but again, uh, working one at a time, I start with a drawing, a small drawing. Eventually that drawing is drawn onto a larger piece of paper. This is paper that you see. In fact, you can actually maybe see elements of a drawing, a part that I was thinking of putting on and decided not to. Um, but I'll do a small drawing first. I'll uh, translate it into this larger scale. Sometimes things have to change when you go to a larger scale. Uh, slight alterations here and there. Once I get the drawing up, then I begin to think about the color. I don't think about the color in the initial drawing, the small drawing. Color doesn't come to mind until I've scaled up the small drawing to the scale I want it to be, the piece to be, and then color and texture and what have you come to mind at that point. This is a six foot uh, Afro Sentinel here. You see the two legs that it's standing on. Kind of a hint of African sculpture. This is the other series I was telling you about, which is called The Weight, W-E-I-G-H-T. And this one, with the weight, you'll see legs at either end, short legs that are holding all of this up. But in this particular piece, I think it's almost like this uh, geographical kind of cutting into the land. So you're seeing the layering of, uh, you know, maybe stone and different types of earth and granite and what have you. Uh, that upper part might be the sky there. And uh, you'll notice that it's beginning to sag down. This area here begins to go down and then it comes back up. Again, this is the weight. And again, slowly begins to inch back up. Um, so in this series, again, there's always this configuration of uh, something that seems to be really kind of a burden and coming down and then um, back up. And you know, this idea of the weight of so much stuff on all of our shoulders these days. There's another cantilevered. You can see again where I put the legs, the table kind of aspect, and uh, all of these shapes piling up on top, trying to balance. Some of the shapes are hanging over the table. Um, so the shapes are telling the story. This one for some odd reason reminds me a little bit of a cityscape and the different buildings and what have you. Again, it's an architectural term. Uh, there was a point in time that I wanted to be an architect. So, and it was the architects that began to work with Mylar back in the fifties. DuPont began to make this wonderful surface that was much stronger than uh, tracing paper. These pieces are large. These are, this is another one that's over six feet. I'm getting on the ladder to hang these works. I'm getting on the ladder to make these works. In many ways, when I'm working this scale, I don't really think of them as collages. I really feel as though I'm a builder. Uh, of course, my love of uh, architecture comes into play. This particular piece uh, is a cantilever, but it's on stilts. And if you notice, those stilts go all the way up to the top of the piece. And they're really almost acting like I-beams. And of course, we know I-beams are what's allowing these buildings to have the cantilever structure. Um, we also see I-beams in the subways. Next time you go down, take a look. Those iron beams are the shape of eyes, a capital I, 
and it's holding up the city from crashing down onto the subway. Uh, very strong. So in this instance, I have the I-beams going up. I was thinking of uh, actually New Orleans and Katrina. And I know that uh, the actor Brad Pitt, who also wanted to be an architect, has actually designed and raised money. And I think he has built almost a hundred homes, if not more, um, for the folks in the Ninth Ward, allowing them to keep their land, but then building these homes on stilts so that if there's another hurricane and flood, uh, the, the homes will be above the water. Again, uh, working with different textures, a sense of syncopation, very tactile surfaces that I like to use. And again, as I'm working on these and going up on the ladder and drawing and what have you, I really feel that I'm more of a builder than a collagist or even assemblage. There's something that's so close to uh, building a structure in my mind, in my creative mind. And now we're gonna take a look at some more of the Afro Sentinels. Yes, so these are my Afro Sentinels. Just want you to get a sense of the scale of them. Um, and I'm thinking of them in terms of African sculpture, um, bringing a different tip to them. I'm also seeing myself involved in Afrofuturism um, as these float on the wall. Mm -hmm. 